So I walked into a slaughterhouse and tried to save a baby lamb in 2007. I've been sued and criminally charged in well over a dozen cases. You can have up to 2% or 3% other types of meat in it, which is like if a mouse fell in or something like that when they're chewing it up and it's like, ah, they're gonna get in there. It's like, ugh. The reality is there have been numerous sites of showing that you have animals who are sick, diseased, you know, something contaminated with feces or rat carcasses. Your point of view didn't get you arrested. What what got you arrested? What what happened there? Where were you born? How did you get into this? You know, were your parents lawyers or whatever leads sure. you down this path? Or was this something one day that you just decided, hey, this is this is the hill I'm gonna die on. Yeah. Oh God. Um, yeah, I was born in central Indiana in a extremely conservative, extremely, uh, white County. And my parents were part of one of the first waves of Chinese immigration after the immigration and nationalization act was passed in 1965, which finally abolished racial quotas on immigration. So they came in the early 1970s, I think 1971. So it was just within five, six years of racial quotas being abolished as a result of the civil rights movement, they took advantage and came to this country. And central Indiana was not the most welcoming place for no from China. That's not <laughs> true. I won't. I, I won't. I mean, it's not because the people are bad for the record. I mean, I thought they were really good people. I think. Human beings naturally are a little afraid of change and yeah. and a little afraid of things that are different. And 100%, the vast majority of people overcome this when they actually get familiar with change and get to know people are a little different. They realize, oh, you know, you're gay, but it's not that threatening. You're just gay. Who cares? Right. It's, right. You're actually an awesome person. That actually happened to me. I mean, I grew up in a very homophobic part of the country. And then when I went to college, I met the first gay man who was across the hall from me in college. And he was a great guy. And I just thought, wait, why, why should I dislike you? You're just cool. I mean, I've right. got no problems with you. And, you know, but in the early 1980s, there hadn't been much exposure to, to immigrants and Chinese people and places like central Indiana. So it was a pretty hard life. But the one um, friend I had in the neighborhood, you know, all the kids made fun of me. Because I, I mean, there were a lot of reasons to dislike me. I was a fat kid, I was a nerd, you know, all sorts of reasons to dislike me. But the, the one um kid who loved me a lot I was, gonna say, was, I was gonna say those are the guys that are ruling the running the country now you know? <laughs> <laughs> the same guys that when i grew up everybody picked on that now are like you know now they're running now they're all billionaires and plant and going to mars and you yeah. know we're running amazon and it, you're like wow there's a lot of truth to that and i think it's 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 not even just that they i think that it's, it's almost causally related that when you're picked on a lot you're just less afraid of failure and risk because i got i mean this is kind of dark but the first time i thought about killing myself i think was in first grade um wow. i used to dream about basically i'd go into the bathroom open up the you know the little cupboard with all the industrial chemicals like and just think about i mean which one of these could kill me because it was i mean it was particularly bad because i think it was within the first couple of weeks of first grade i got glasses i still have terrible extremely thick glasses and back then you know our family was pretty poor so we got the cheapest plastic ultra thick glasses for my vision which was already terrible in first grade and i kid you not i think it was the first week of first grade i broke my glasses and they had to be taped up and mm. i don't know if this is still a thing but when i was growing up having taped up glasses was like the most being four eyes was already bad enough but then right. having taped up plastic glasses with lenses that are this thick you know, like this thick when you're in first grade, it's awful. But there's one kid in the neighborhood who loved me, and that was a dog. Like my neighbor's dog just fucking loved me. And I um and I said kid because I I I really do see dogs, especially as their kids. I mean, they they're literally like baby wolves who we have genetically engineered through ten thousand years of selective breeding to be puppies their entire lives. An adult dog is like a puppy, is a wolf. And I just love dogs. Um, but then I had a pretty traumatic experience when we went back to, to China for the first time because I was born over here and I'm an American. But my family went back to China in around 1989. And for the first time in my life, I realized 
something deeply was wrong was happening to animals because I saw dogs being killed for meat. Um, and it messed me up a little bit as a kid. I had lots of nightmares and sent me down the path I'm on today. Okay. What, and, and what, when did this start? Like you went to college or you just, you've uh, like, you're saying sent you down the path, but at what point did you say, Hey, this is something I'm going to pursue. And, and, it, and this isn't a full-time job, right? Like you've got a regular job. Like at this point, it's not just a full-time job. It's like five full time jobs. I, I've been sued and criminally charged in well over a dozen cases over the last five years. Um, and even just kind of keeping myself afloat. I mean, they've taken all my money away. I was recently incarcerated, so I just got out of jail. Um, and I've still got all these active cases against me. Honestly, that first experience where I saw for the first time that there's something wrong with our relationship to animals, because it didn't matter what anyone told me, what any authority figure told me, uh, what my dad told me, because my dad, when we saw these dogs outside of a restaurant, we were getting prepared for slaughter. You know, I said, hey, dad, we got to save these dogs. This is wrong. And he said, well, this is just what they're taught here. And it was the first time I recognized a lot of the things authority figures are teaching us are wrong. And, you know, I was a very well-behaved kid. It never occurred to me to break any rules. And But there was no one who could convince me that a rule that said it is okay to slaughter a dog was okay. And I, that experience really shook me up. And I had nightmares for years. I mean, decades later, I still have nightmares about that experience as a kid. Um but it didn't occur to me that one could be an activist for animals until, what, almost 20 years later, um, in the late, mid to late 2000s. I went vegan in 1999, uh, failed at it for about two years, and then finally when my first dog died in 2001, I committed to it 100%. But even then, I was primarily just a lawyer. I was a law professor for a short period of time at Northwestern. Uh, but it wasn't until... I was at another low point in my life, basically failing as a law professor, unable to get a tenure track job, which was my only dream. My entire childhood was my professional dream was I want to be a law professor. But I said, you know, F it. I'm sucking at everything I'm doing in life. I might as well do something that I think is good for the world. And so I walked into a slaughterhouse and tried to save a baby lamb in 2007. It's one of the last remaining slaughterhouses for mammals in the city of Chicago which used to be the slaughterhouse capital of the nation. But Chicago is pretty representative of how animal abuse has been hidden from all of us because what used to be the slaughterhouse capital of the world has disappeared. You know, all the stockyards and factory farms and abattoirs have been moved out to the countryside far away from where most people live. But that experience of walking in the slaughterhouse taught me two things. One is everything I'd read about slaughterhouses is real. It is, these are awful, filthy dangerous places and there's something there's something very primitive about fear among mammals and i mean probably a lot of people in your audience have probably experienced this when you see another animal and it doesn't have to be a human being who's afraid you start feeling afraid too because you know there's danger and when you walk into slaughterhouse for the first time if you're attuned to your own feelings the most immediate emotional response you have because you see all these animals who are huddling and they they know they hear the screams of other animals. They can smell the blood and they know they're about to die. And you can feel it too. You're like, whoa. And it's weird because I didn't feel that threatened. I was, there was nobody there. It was the middle of the night. I knew I was alone, but you just feel this fear. Um, and it was, it was pretty powerful and just made me think, damn, everything I thought I knew about slaughterhouses and factory farms, it's even worse. Because when you have the full sensory experience, not just seeing and hearing on some video, but you're smelling, you know, the the blood and the feces and the chemicals you can you can even physically feel like you, there's this film on your skin and your hair afterwards because there's so much like soot and feces and chemicals like you can feel on your skin or your hair when you walk out of a slaughterhouse afterwards which is why so many slaughterhouse workers develop all sorts of terrible health conditions because they're constantly in that film of of death and stress and chemicals because um, there are a lot of crazy chemicals they use in slaughterhouse production uh but probably the, the most important thing about that entire experience wasn't just that I could experience this myself in vivid three-dimensional reality, but it was really easy. <laughs> I, I realized, damn, I can just walk into these places because they're even a very small slaughterhouse. They don't have much labor. I mean, it's all very industrialized. 
they have basically no security because it's too expensive and they're trying to keep the meat as cheap as possible. So I just walked in and I realized, hey, if I didn't actually successfully rescue an animal that day because it turns out a little baby lamb is a 120 pound animal and they're very scared of you and it's going to be impossible to carry them out. I tried, but I failed. But I realized it would be pretty easy to do this. I could document this very, very easily and show the world exactly what I'm seeing. And so that's what I started doing in 2007. So you went in there, you didn't get an animal, you didn't get one. No. They ran away from you. Um, so what, at, at what point did you think like, this is, I'm going to do this. And, and and how do you survive doing this? Like, I mean, do you have a Patreon account? Like, do you have a, <laughs> you know, like do people, is there, do you start a foundation and, and you know, what is that process? Like, did you talk to your, but one of your buddies and say, this is what I want to do. And they said, oh, well, here's yeah. how to, you set it up. I mean, I understand you're an attorney, but yeah, this is a little bit rare. It's yeah, yeah, I'd say it's a little rare. So it's like, how I do I make this a full time job? Yeah, through law school and um, right up to the point that I started at Northwestern, I was actually teaching the LSAT, um, and it was very good living. You know, I uh, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship in law school, so I didn't have to pay tuition, and I was you know basically going to law school for free. And then I uh, was making um, considerable amount of money. I was making like forty dollars an hour teaching the LSAT for ten to twenty hours a week all the way through law school. So I actually built up a pretty good savings account by the time I was done with law school. And then uh, Northwestern paid pretty well too. Law professors are not paid as well as lawyers. They're paid pretty well by academic right. students. So that year, and I, I've always had super low expenses. You know, I've slept on couches and closets. I've lived in some of the dreariest conditions, at least by modern American standards. Like right now I sleep on, my residence is a living room floor, uh, which I share with one other person. There are two people sleeping on a living room floor. And then it's a one bedroom, tiny one bedroom farm in San Francisco. So when you have very low expenses, you can get away with doing things like devoting your life to investigating factory farms and slaughterhouses. Um, but no, for the first, I'd say, uh, 10 or so years that I was doing investigations, it was all self-funded. And I did run out of money. So um, in 2007, I left Northwestern, started doing this sort of work. And then by about 2009, after two years, I just ran out of money. Um, so I did actually, I worked in big law. <laughs> I, I went from, and they had no idea that, you know, my, my moonlighting was sneaking around with factory farms, but I did securities litigation in 2009 after the financial crisis and worked in, in that area for about five years from 2009 to 2014, 2015. And at night, what are you doing? Um, well, I mean, when I was working at big law, it's, I did much less of it for sure. And right. there was a brief moment where I actually thought maybe I will stay in big law. Uh, cause I, 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 I hate to admit this, but I kind of like the job in some ways. <laughs> partly because you can probably tell I, I am the sort of person who likes intense experiences in big law litigation is a pretty intense experience. And, you know, for example, there was a month I remember where I worked every single day, basically from 8 a.m. to midnight every day, including weekends. And I had a lot of fun. I was like, wow, this is really fun. This is intense. And, and so that was, um, it was a good fit for me in some ways. But I went to sleep and I knew I, I don't feel good going to sleep knowing I'm, I mean, for the most part, I didn't feel that bad about the cases because we were primarily a defense firm, but we we're defending ourselves from other big institutions like a hedge funds and a bank. And it's like, I don't care about the other side of this case. I also don't care that much about our client. Right. But I don't care about the other side. And if I take money from some head fund, who cares? You know. But I still felt like, I mean, what's the point of living if you're not doing stuff that you find actually meaningful? And I didn't find my life meaningful. So as much time as I could find, I was continuing to investigate, research, encourage other people to investigate and research factory farms, laboratories, and other animal abusing facilities. I mean, investigate and research, but what, once they say, hey, these are horrible places. Yeah. You're right. Then what? Like, where does it go yeah, from I, there? This is, so this is, this is one of the biggest conundrums in the law, right? And um, I know you, you've documented through your podcast some failures in our legal system. And one failure. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's yeah. a couple. <laughs> yeah. There's a couple that you've documented here and there. But one of the biggest failures that most people don't recognize, and I think you know the fundamental failure of our legal system is it bends to power. If you have a lot of power, the legal system favors you. If you don't have power, the legal system will fuck you. I mean, it will right. just totally destroy you. And, and there's some exceptions to that. Occasionally, a powerful person is held to account. But 
what is even more blatant than the distortion to the legal system from powerful people is powerful systems. And big ag is one of the most powerful systems in American history, corrupting the kind of application of the law to circumstances that matter to all of us. How do they do I'll this? You, do they, they have a, yeah, um, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you kind of an explanation. That's a great question and I'll explain it, but I'll also give a concrete example. And the explanation is it's partly money. It is absolutely money. There's enormous amount of money in, in big ag. Um, and they've always made huge contributions to various elected officials. Agriculture was the original industry of the United States. This is a nation of farmers. Uh, almost all the founding fathers were farmers. You know, at, at the twenty of the the twentieth century in the early nineteen hundreds, one in two Americans lived on a farm. All right. One in two. Now it's less than one percent. Yeah. I'm I'm guessing you don't live on a farm. No, no. But I do you know I do anyone know that, who lives on a know, farm. Um, I know several people that work in the in the um farm industry which would be uh the mm -hmm. um basically like the milk industry like they they they're yeah. cattle farms and they um yeah. uh, but they probably don't live on the farm actually my wife was raised on a on really you, you, here so here's what happens and, and and i'm sure this is everywhere i, I but I, I only know florida so in florida they have these you know they're they're dairies and mm -hmm. they'll have and i mean an outrageous amount of cows have fifteen thousand cows yeah and uh, my wife's father is a um, a breeder, so yeah. he's always worked on farms. It's all I think. It's, I think that's all he's ever done. His wow. two brothers work on farms, breeders. My wife has worked on at the same farms as my dad. I mean, as her father. Her mother for a long period of time worked there until they they separated. They met because her mother was a milker. My wife's wow. sister is take basically. She's not a breeder. She, 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 I forget her name, but she's like a nurse. Like, like yeah. when the calves are born, they take sure. them away from the moms and they se separate them. And, and if they get sick or something, they have to kind of, you know, nurse them. Sure. right. So her, she does that. I don't know what her actual title is, but she does that full time. And what happens is the bulk of the industry in Florida, which I'm assuming is pretty much everywhere is made up by, um, like Mexicans or immigrants at the very least, mm -hmm. some kind of South American immigrants. And so let's say 90% of them are, are, you know, migrant workers or whatever. So they come in, you know, they pay them very little. You know, it's also funny about that. They don't get overtime. Wow. So you can have them work 80 hours a week hours and you pay them the yeah. same shitty $11 or $12 yeah. an hour. And, but they also, they're, you know, a lot of them don't have, have, um, driver's licenses, papers. right? They don't yeah. have papers. They don't have driver's licenses. They have, they have issues and a lot of them, they, they make enough money. Then they, then they drink it away, you know, so they can't pay their bills. So here's what they kind of figured out was, you know what? We can have them live on the farm. We can build farm, really yep. cheap houses and have them stay what? in dairy houses. So mm -hmm. my wife was raised until the age of, I don't know if it's nine or 10 or something like that on a, a dairy. Farm. Wow. And her okay. brothers were even longer because, you know, they were right. like 12, 13, 14 years old. And her father's, her father to this day lives in a, a dairy house. Is um, your wife an immigrant? No, it, it, which was funny because talk about being in a minority and they're like the only white people on this. Her sister <laughs> speaks fluent Spanish. Her, my, Spanish yeah. my wife said her, her Spanish is better than her English. She's married to a wow. Mexican. Sure. Cause um, she raised, she was raised around a bunch of well, Mexicans. Yeah. yeah all her kids. Are, that's, that's. That's the labor force of agriculture today. You're right. It's all migrants. Right, right. And they do. And it's funny too, because, you know, when we first met, I mean, she doesn't work there now. Now she's a, a mm -hmm. she's a, a Marine mechanic, but mm -hmm. you know, I would call her or she would call me and I'd say, what are you doing? She's like, nothing. And I go, mm -hmm. what do you work? She go, yeah. I go, well, what's going on? She's like, I've been here for like four hours. They're not doing anything. She's like, the, the, the machine's broke. I go, so why don't they send everybody home? She goes, they don't have, they can't send them home. As soon as it, mm -hmm. you know, we have to produce this much milk today. Yeah. The milk's waiting. We can't leave it there. They have to fix the machines or the pumps or whatever. So we wait. And I was like, well, do you get overtime? She's like, no, we just sit no. here. So you just sit here for 12 hours and do nothing. And, she, you know, it's so, you know, and it, like you said, it, it sucks. The, you should see these houses. They're not great. They're horrible. They're all on dirt roads. Yep. 
it's uh you know it's it's a miserable kind of existence but probably yeah. better than living somewhere in south america yeah yeah um, you know that much great. right it's a trade-off yeah so i mean yeah and you're right the the, the conditions are often deplorable for the workers themselves and and that's a circumstance where it might be better, but there have been circumstances, including a factory farm. Hold on, hold on. We're talking about you. We were just talking about you. What is your sister's job? Which one? Uh, the, the, um, we should take care of the, the little baby calves. What do they call it? They don't call it anything? No, she's a farmer. I don't she works. She goes, I don't know. She's a farmer. Okay. I thought it had a special, <laughs> her dad is a breeder. She always say he's a breeder. Huh? I thought they had a special huh? name. Sorry. My fault. Yeah. Takes care of the baby cows. That's what she said. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So sorry. Yeah, you were saying- no, no. I mean, just, yeah, I was talking about the political influence in the industry, but it's funny. You say 15,000 cows. My guess is a lot of people are like, whoa, 15,000 cows. And it's like, that's pretty standard, if not small. Oh, yeah, yeah. This has changed. A hundred years ago, if there was a facility of 15,000 cows, honestly, that would sound like some sort of fantasy to people. Like there, there were no herds there were no dairy industry facilities in 1900 in the united states with 15,000 cows it's like come on what is this some sort of fa- you know fable like that's that sounds like it's impossible just because it can't be not but industrialization of agriculture all the, i mean you would mention a machine that broke down oh yeah you know, this this is a very mechanized process nowadays so oh, this is not should- I've been there. Listen, I've been, her dad works at another place now, but I've been to both places. And, and, you know, yeah. when they herd the cows through, you know, they've got a whole series yeah, of entire you know, machines. And, yep. Yeah. And they move them and it pushes them and moves them and they give them yep, shots. It's an assembly they, line. Yeah. They pump them full of chemicals to keep them, yep. you know, uh, yeah. I mean, her dad does. Which like, incidentally, there's a lot of evidence that that kids, which is why a lot of people are buying organic milk nowadays, right? Because of I, all the hormones in milk. My wife is proof of that. Yeah, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. No. <laughs> I, mean, I know people have actually been affected negatively. So, and it's not their fault, you know, like, right. If you've had some sort of developmental disorder because of all the hormones, but these animals are, are evolutionary kin. So the growth hormones that they often pump the cows up with can affect us in very negative yeah, ways. Yeah, got, yeah, of course. You know, look at, listen, we were talking to somebody the other day about people in Vietnam and mm-hmm. Cambodia and mm. we were like listen you look at, you look at a 20 year old here mm-hmm. 20 year old kid he, g- girl here and you look like a, a 20 year old in Cambodia they look like 12 year olds mm-hmm. you know like uh, the the yeah. women here are just it, it's you know it's yeah. the same it's you know, they just, yeah it's 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 like they're the same age and it's like you you would think there's 10 years between the two of them like as yeah. quickly as we're developing and um, you know, and that's gotta be, and I'm sure there's many studies that have something to do with the steroids that are pumped into them and the, the drugs yep, and yep. everything else and chemicals that, so yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm sure. And you know, they, they do it, you know, they obviously, they want to keep the animals healthy and producing milk, mm-hmm. and, but then again, you the same thing when you, we, we watched this, uh, my wife and I watched this thing on, um, chickens the other day right. on the chicken industry or dairy and in, no, what's, what do they call it? Poultry, sorry. Poultry industry. Horrible, bro. Not horrible. Out. Even when they say free, it, like it was the first time I, yeah, you know, I would think free range, range, free ranges. That's yeah, it's not so. <laughs> these aren't these they, little they birds are. aren't running around in the hills or you know in the. It's <laughs> just they got now they got three feet by three feet or two yep. feet by two feet free range. Yep, two feet by two feet, and sometimes they don't even get to use it. You know, right. they just have a little window. They say like in theory the chickens could go out, so you got to shed with you know twenty eight thousand chickens, and then you have a three by, feet by three feet little patio where the enclosure opens up and they don't even open the door, let them out. And they still market it as free range. I mean, it's yeah. Oh, and they're, they're and, fully and, grown in like six well, weeks. Yeah. They're fully grown. They're breaking their legs and they're it's, yeah, it's yeah. horrific. Yeah. Anywhere from one to five to sometimes as many as one in three chickens can't even walk by the time they reach the slaughterhouse, they're having mobility issues. Uh, and those diseases that are causing these chickens to be debilitated, that's not good for us either. You know, now for, for me, the primary reason to avoid these things is because of the suffering of the animals. I see no difference between a chicken and a dog. And I wouldn't want to see a dog hobble around and kill because someone wanted to eat her. But even if you don't give a damn about the chicken for her own sake, I mean, you should be concerned because most of what we eat is kind of sick, debilitated animals. And that's not good for us. And one of the reasons they're able to get away with this is, though, because of the enormous amount of money and the historical importance of that, that that's kind of the second reason there's so much corruption and lack of enforcement even of 
consumer protection standards. Um, you know, one of the reasons that free range chicken farm, for example, can continue to market itself as free range is because there's a law in the books called the Poultry Products Inspection Act. This is a law that was originally passed along with the Meat Products Inspection Act in the early 1900s after Upton Sinclair, who's one of the most famous journalists and writers in American history, wrote this book called The Jungle in 1904, I think it was. It might have been 1905, 1906, somewhere around that. And he did field work in the Chicago stockyards. He just like walked around in Chicago looking at all the animals and all the animals being slaughtered and was horrified. It was horrifying because this is just like the beginnings of the industrialization of agriculture. And so you're seeing all the chemicals, you're seeing the assembly lines starting to develop. And Upton Sinclair is like, holy shit, holy shit. You're seeing people with their arms decapitated. You're seeing like tumors gross going into the meat, like rats and mice ending up in your ground beef. This is like chaos. This is chaos. And he writes his book and the entire country is upset about it and saying, what the hell? I thought we were eating meat. This isn't even meat. This is like a mouse's head or, you know, and you don't know because it's all ground up or it's like a tumorous cancer's growth. This isn't meat. This is literally, you know, vermin. This is vermin and filth that we're being fed. And as a result, the federal government passed a law called the Meat Products Inspection Act, which sounds great. And one of the primary planks of this law was consumer protection. There is this provision in the Meat Products Inspection Act that, that said misbranding falsely advertising your products is illegal. And one of the most magical and devastating tricks the industry has used over the last, really, I'd say a few hundred years, but certainly starting with the Meat Products Inspection Act, is taking the very laws that are supposed to protect consumers and using those same laws to shield the industry from accountability. Because what's happened with the Meat Products Inspection Act, the MPIA gives exclusive authority across the entire nation to regulate misbranding to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So uh, if you as a state government or a county government, so say in the state of California, and this, this is a little example that happened. California, about 15 years ago, tried to pass a law saying, hey, we don't really like the idea of down cows ending up in the meat supply, right? A down cow is a cow who can't walk because they could have mad cow disease. They could have, you know, some sort of virus. They could have bacteria. I mean, who knows what they have? But, you know, a cow who's so sick that she can't even walk let's not eat her. You know, let's right. not slaughter her. So let's try to get this out of the system. And this law that California tried to pass to protect consumers in California was struck down by a federal court on the grounds that, nope, sorry, the only agency in the entire nation that's allowed to regulate slaughterhouses is the USDA. And you as a state government, you as a county government cannot interfere. And, and what happened to the USDA almost immediately after the Meat Products Inspection Act was passed, it was co-opted by the industry. The industry immediately infiltrated it. If you even today, hundred years later, if you look at the Secretary of Agriculture, all the higher ups in the industry, it's a revolving door of industry executives. Tom Vilsack is the current Secretary of Agriculture. He was making a cool million or two every year as the head of the U.S. Dairy Export Council right before he became the Secretary of Agriculture for basically doing no work. It was like one of those gang jobs where they just pay you for nothing. Right. <laughs> he sat around doing nothing. They paid him like a cool million. Because they knew it was politically powerful and they needed to get him back into a position of power. So he would be the one regulating the slaughterhouses and factory farms. And that's exactly where he is today. And that's why all these laws that are intended to protect animals and consumers just aren't enforced. They really aren't. Um, but the concrete example I want to give you, because, you know, obviously people are going to say, who, this guy is a crazy vegan. Of course, he's going to say stuff like that. Who knows what's actually well, happening? Pat Basu, who is a former for many years, was the chief veterinarian of the Food Safety Inspection Service. So this is the guy who's responsible for overseeing all the 10 billion farm animals across the country, ensuring there are no infections or diseases that are reaching human consumers, right? This is his job. He was the chief veterinarian. He was at the top. Right. I've gotten to know him over the last couple of years, and he he became a whistleblower. He left the USDA on good terms. Like, he was he was a solid bureaucrat. But after he left, he had, he had so much guilt about what happened. That he's come out and now said, the reality is there is basically no one willing to stand up to big pork and big ag, not even the U.S. government. Um, and so, for example, when there was an outbreak in, I think it was Washington State, the New York Times covered this and in this article about tainted pork. There's an outbreak of, I believe, is an E. coli that was making a lot of kids sick. When the USDA and even the CDC said, hey, this seems like a problem. 
all these kids are sick. They're going to ERs, you know, almost surely some kids are dying from this. Shouldn't we figure out where, what farm it came from? Like, that's kind of what we do, contact tracing, right? I mean, that's kind of the obvious thing you do epidemiologically when there's a disease. You got to figure out where it came from. Right. And so all they did was they, they went to the federal government and the USDA and said, hey, you guys, you know, under the Meat Products Inspection Act, you have the exclusive authority. Is it okay if you use this authority so we can at least go and test and figure out where this disease came from? And Big Pork and the USDA vetoed it, so we never found out where that bug came from. And again, it's there's a, an article by uh, Matt Rictel in the New York Times about this. And and this is the sort of story that Papa Sue told me and said, this is a sham. This system is not protecting consumers. It's protecting extremely powerful corporations who have an interest in minimizing the amount of negative exposure so people keep eating meat and keep eating cheap meat that it's filled with antibiotics and hormones and don't realize that this isn't just torturing animals, it's potentially killing human beings. So who's appointing these people to the food and drug? Uh, is it the food? What'd you say? The, what, the USDA. Food. The USDA. US, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So to the US. And Donald oh, okay. Trump. And it's, it's, it's bipartisan corruption because Tom Vilsack is a hack for the industry, but so is Sonny Perdue, the former Secretary of Agriculture. So it's, like, a, it's like the Federal Reserve where they, they go and they give the president 10 names, all of which they're okay with, and he picks one. So it yes, seems like hacks. it seems yep. so, so that he they can say, well, the president appointed this person. Well, you gave me 10 names to pick from. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like people think that, oh, it's he appointed him. It's not really how it works. No, They're like, we're good. It's with not our how it works at all. Yeah. It's yeah. not how it works at all. And, you know, part of the reason in presidential politics, especially, it's really hard to disentangle our democracy from corporate corruption is that Iowa is the first caucus in the nation and Iowa is one of the biggest farm states. And everyone on the left and the right feels like they have to bow down to the industry. And every presidential candidate, th there there are some policies that every everyone who's looked at the policy agrees that it's just stupid. It's just it's literally just straight up corporate bribery. They're just giving money away. Like ethanol. Ethanol subsidies are widely understood for corn. Like there's a document about big corn. Uh, right. And there, there's just there's no one who's a policy analyst who think this makes any sense at all. You're basically giving money away to, and primarily it's a subsidized factory farming because when you get feed costs like corn costs and soy costs super low, the main beneficiary of that because most of the most of the crops in this country are fed to farm animals, they're not fed to human beings. You know, because farm animals eat a huge amount of you know corn and soy and, and all sorts of things and alfalfa. I didn't, I didn't know yeah, that. and everybody, everybody on the left and the right, whether it's a heritage foundation, the Cato Institute, the Brookings Institute. Everyone who's a policy analyst said, this is a totally steered policy that's just like giving away taxpayer money to billionaires. You know, why are we doing this? And yet, even Elizabeth Warren, you know, even people, Bernie Sanders, like people I otherwise would love to support, when they go into Iowa, they all bow down to the industry and say, yes, we will give you and your millionaires and your billionaires taxpayer money. It's, it's completely ludicrous. So, I mean, what is... So what do you think the, so, well, I was thinking first, first, I keep thinking about, um, I had heard a statistic when you would know, like, isn't it like with, with meat and stuff, like there's a certain amount or, or is it, or is it like orange juice or something? I forget what it was. Something I heard one time, like there's a certain percentage that they're okay with. Like, it can be like, like, you know, insects and bugs. Like there's a certain percentage of meat that yes. it has allowable, like you can have up to 2% or 3% other types of meat in it, which is like if a mouse fell in or something like that when they're chewing it up and it's like, ah, they're going to get in there. It's like, ugh. Yeah. So in theory, under the Meat Products Inspection Act, adulterated animal products are prohibited. And adulterated means diseased, you know, something contaminated with feces or rat carcasses or whatever. In practice, the reality is there have been numerous exposés showing that you have animals who are sick. You have animals who are already dead. And so we don't know exactly how they die, why they're ending up in the meat supply. Again, the down cow problem, right? You wouldn't think it'd be that controversial to say, hey, if this, this animal is so sick they can't even walk, maybe we should not be killing them to eat them. Um, animals that are contaminated with chemicals of various sorts or hormones, or antibiotics. You know, there's an antibiotic called Carbidox that um, the FDA has acknowledged is a carcinogen at all levels. There's no safe level of carbidox that leads to cancer. It's a carcinogen. It's been banned pretty much everywhere in the world. 
except the United States because of big pork. And Smithfield, the largest pork production company in the world that has relentlessly tried to put me in prison for the last, you know, seven or so years, they continue to feed Carbidox to all their piglets. And so the theory and the practice are very different. In theory, at least with the respect to meat products, it should be the case that none of the adulterated products should be sold to consumers. And practice, given the absolute absence of any sort of enforcement, there's a lot of adulterated animal products that end up in the food supply. And one of the dangerous things is if there's some bacteria or fungus or even virus that attacks a soybean, the odds that that virus is going to be able to affect, affect us are very low because you are not a soybean. I am not a soybean. Right. We, on the other hand, you are a mammal. I am a mammal. And swine flu is a real thing that affects not just you, but me. E. coli is a real thing that affects not just you, but me. Salmonella yeah. is a thing that affects not just chickens, but human beings. And so if you have an adulterated plant-based food product, that's terrible and it shouldn't happen. But the odds that that's going to kill you are very low. You've got an adulterated animal product. I mean, salmonella alone, the CDC has done research showing that there's something like 150, 180,000 Americans who get sick from salmonella from egg products alone. Six figures. You know, we, we were concerned about the hundred thousand, couple hundred thousand people who died from COVID, and rightfully so in my view. But there are literally over a hundred thousand people getting sick from salmonella from eggs because these filthy factory farms. And the USDA does almost nothing. And when the CDC tries to say, eh, you know, it's not so good that people are getting sick. The factory farming industry is so powerful, they're not even allowed to do testing to figure out where it came from. That's so how bad what, it is. So what's the what's the solution to that problem? Yeah, other I mean, than breaking, is, other than breaking in and freeing animals. Well, I think honestly, and this this might seem like uh, this might seem like a leap for people until they understand the importance of direct action. Historically, I do think the solution is partly people breaking into these places and exposing what's happening because the government isn't willing to be a good watchdog. If the industry isn't going to be a good watchdog for itself, somebody has to be the watchdog, and that means ordinary citizens. Well, I was going to say, what about it's like what about going into the uh, um, instead of letting these be presidential appointed positions, you know, having them ha yeah. somebody somebody else, you know, from a from a legislative standpoint, yep. you know, other than invoking so, a, a January sixth incident here. Other than that, let's go with legislation at this point, or not appointing, you know, some guy who donated a lot to your campaign. For sure. That is a great idea that cannot be achieved without transparency. Right. Because the public doesn't even know there's a problem. 75% of Americans today, when you ask them, even after 20 years of exposés in factory farms and slaughterhouses, still believe the animal products I personally consume come from places that are well-maintained. The animal welfare standards are high. The animals are well-treated. 75% of Americans. 99% of animal products come from factory farms. That when people see the conditions, they're so horrible People turn away. They literally don't even want to look at the slaughterhouse or factory farm we're showing. So there's but a they will stop at McDonald's on the way home and get and get chicken McNuggets. Exactly. And it's it's because seventy five percent of Americans legitimately think that it's probably okay. They think the government's doing their job. They think the industry is self regulating. And it's not. So the first step is we need transparency even to start a conversation on this subject. And as long as the industry is covering things up, and it's not just the industry covering things up. Have you heard of the ag gag laws that have been passed across the nation? I know it sounds familiar, but I have a horrible yeah. memory. So, ag gag laws are laws that make it a crime to document inside of an animal enterprise, a laboratory, a fur farm, or a factory farm. Okay. And you might think, how is that possible? I thought we had a first amendment, and we do. And these laws have been have been challenged in court, and they've been struck down repeatedly across the country, but it hasn't stopped the industry from passing them and it hasn't stopped people from being prosecuted. You know, and we, one of the reasons we started doing what we do, which is just going into a factory farm in the middle of the night without any consent, without even pretending to be employees, without using any sort of manipulation to try and get access consensually is because all the methods that activists used to use and advocacy groups used to use to expose factory farms suddenly became illegal. Uh, because the ag ag laws in Utah, and Iowa, and North Carolina, all the states where we've done these investigations that have led me to be charged and jailed have these ag ag laws. And while 
they're unconstitutional. Sometimes it can take five years to litigate that and maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars to get to the point that law is, is actually, you know, ultimately vacated by a federal court. It's so, still a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of huge amount of money. Right. You know, as you know, you've been embroiled in the legal system. You know how much yeah. of a hindrance it is. It's, it's such a difficult thing to litigate. And, you know, the, the reality is the animal movement and, and consumers, I mean, each individual consumer, you know, they have an interest in this, but it's not like any individual consumer is going to fund a multi-million dollar lawsuit to ensure there's transparency and effective fund. That's a lot of money. Well, it, even so, in the, even in the end, it's like, does that change anything? Cause I see people with these hidden cameras on going into, yeah. you know, and they'll show like, you know, they'll show like different uh, industries. They'll show the chickens and the, you know, and the, uh, the cows and, you know, the, the horrific things that are happening. And, um, but in the, and I've, you know, watched the, I've watched the documentaries. Yeah. But, you know, I still had a, a, a TV dinner with, with, you know, chicken in it today. So, I mean, yeah. so what I'm saying is like, you know, I don't know that, I don't know how you get that. Cause every time you see one of these, you're, you're yep. horrified for a couple hours, maybe a day or two. Maybe you talk to about, you tell your friends about it for two days, but you still end up going out and getting, you know, you know, getting a steak at, you know, on your anniversary or whatever. Yep. So it's like, how do you, so to me, I, I don't see that, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. I don't see like suddenly people just stop eating meat. I think that you, that probably legislation of some kind yep. it, or, you know, like you said, transparency, which would lead probably lead to legislation. Yep. Um, yeah. I, I think you're pointing to the fundamental problem, which is that every human being individually is quite busy. You've got a lot on your mind and whether it's the environment, worker abuses, you know, like probably some of the migrant workers, your, your wife worked with, uh, animal cruelty issues, I, you just don't have time, especially in today's world where people are under so much stress. Like I think the well, statistic is. And it's, and it, you know, it, they're, and they're struggling with, you know, and let's face it, you know, food is pretty cheap, even though it's getting more it expensive, is it is yeah. cheap. And for you to go, like you said, like you're vegan, mm -hmm. like, you know, that, that can be expensive and difficult to, where, where you eat and it, it causes all kinds of problems for you. Like, where do we go eat? Where do I you have this? Yeah. How, how was it prepared? Well, here, here, here's the, the fundamental problem. That for a long time, not just advocates, but even the industry itself, and um, this is very true of climate change. When you read, um, I think it's the book by Michael Mann called The New Climate War um, about fossil fuels. For a long time, these big industries have tried to wrest responsibility for all these abuses on individual consumers. So, for example, you got the Chevrons of the world saying, you know, we'd love to do something about climate change, but people just love their SUVs. There's nothing to be done. And similarly, McDonald's says, we'd love to do something about animal cruelty, but people love their chicken nuggets. What are we supposed to do? I mean, they want cheap chicken nuggets. And what, what that misses is that the problem is systemic in origin. Like each of us individually, if, if we had a choice, if I could give you a choice between having a delicious form of meat that involved no cruelty in any animal, no violence in any animal, and a delicious form of meat that involved cruelty in animal. 100% or almost 100%. There's a small percentage of psychopaths who'd say like, yeah, let's go ahead and torture them. But 100% right. of people are going to say like, no, I want the meat that doesn't involve cruelty. Yeah. But you're not given that but, choice. Well, you're even if you choice. did that, like you probably could at this point, but that meat would be a lot more. You'd have to make it as no, it the, wouldn't. the same cost. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And I'll tell you what the solution is. Plant-based and alternative meats. I really think this is the future. I think that if you look at kind of just the resource costs, there are countries and cultures through human history that have had plant-based meats. Meat, meat doesn't mean from animal. Meat is just a protein-based substance. Tofu can be a meat. Seitan can be a meat. You know, Beyond Burgers are a form of meat. It's literally Beyond Meat. There, there are delicious, sustainable, and more ecologically and economically efficient forms of forming protein that civilizations in India and China have used for thousands of years. Okay. You know, my ancestors in China for example, ate tons of meat and it just wasn't based on animals. And, right. and just, even if you look at the thermodynamics, the most efficient form of meat is chicken, right? And do you know how many calories of edible protein we're using to produce one chicken? In other words, the input output ratio, how many calories of human edible protein is going into producing the chicken to get one protein of chicken calories out? I have no idea. It's about eight or nine to one. Which means we're throwing away like 80%, 90% of the value. So if we shifted our food system towards plant-based proteins, and again, I'm sure a lot of people on this 
audience are thinking, oh my God, I don't want to eat the Beyond Burger. The reality is it's a relatively minor cultural shift. And if we actually invested, there are tens of billions of dollars in government subsidies that have gone into designing, genetically engineering, selectively breeding animals. There's there's literally a meat institute that the federal government funds in Nebraska where they just experiment on producing meat of various types, making it cheaper, right. making it more delicious. If we use those same subsidies for meat, not based on animals, and that could be cell cultures, it could be plant-based alternatives, um, it could be all sorts of things. It could be just making better beans. You know, people love beans. So whatever it is. So re- and we can re- have a meat based system that involves no animals at all. And I okay. think that is the future. So I'm getting I, I, I have I have a wife. She's sure. sitting on the couch and she's raising her hand for about the last <laughs> five minutes. So and I, I think I'm I think she she'll correct me. I think because okay. we were watching this the other day where there's Talk. like a machine and what was it? An in 3D printed meat. Have Absolutely. you heard this? I mean, of course I you have. Yeah. Um, I know people like, work on these sorts of things. Super interesting, right? Like we're looking at, we're like, this looks amazing. Like this is, an, and yeah. it's just an enzyme, right? Isn't it an enzyme yep. or something? To cell culture. That. Yeah. Yeah. Where they actually grow it. And, and um, so that I thought was super. And that's, is that what the hand? Okay. That was good. I, yeah, I know I absolutely. Work. The the other thing I was going to mention is, and this is funny. This isn't, has nothing to do with meat. Um, but I, wa- I, well, I read an article. God, this was 10 years ago. I was in prison when I read this and it was in like popular science or something. Yeah. Um, and it talked about how government, how farms are subsidized by the government. And there were basically, they were taking um, shipping containers and they could put them in a, in a vacant lot in the middle of New York city and stack them, ho- uh, stack them on top of each other or go into a, a, a warehouse and they could create these farms right, right in the middle of the city that were producing, you know, they, they were taking like one acre of a far or, or one or two acre facility mm-hmm. in the city that would produce the same as 40 or 60 acres out in the middle of, you know, wherever they're growing, you know, Idaho or something. And they Amazing. were, they were explaining that it took 80% less water, um, it took uh, no, ki- there were no chemicals involved because it's inside. There's no, there's no yep. mosquito. There's no bugs. Yep. You don't have to do anything it, to kill off all the pests. Yeah. Right. It, the, they grow, they grow like, they were growing like, they were getting, instead of like three harvests a year or something, they were getting like 12 harvests a year because they're growing 24 hours a day. They just have UV yep. lights. So the yep. whole thing, when the guy broke it all down, they were like, but this is, this is amazing. It's they're genius. like, why aren't yeah. these everywhere? And they said, we're. Basically, at almost the same uh, dollar. Oh, you also don't have to ship them. Mm-hmm. You don't have in shipping. You lose twenty percent of the product. Mm-hmm. So they were explaining, like, no, no, we've got a hundred percent. We're delivering a hundred percent of what we're growing. You know, doesn't cost gas. Doesn't cost all these things. They go through the whole thing. And they were like, well, we, and he said, we're almost able to compete with farms. They will. They said, well, you would think, based on what you're saying, you'd be really able to compete. You'd be much, much cheaper. And they said, well, we real technically we are, but we are not subsidized. Subsidized. Exactly. So we, we're not subsidized. So as a result, and, and think about how amazing that is. Like now I don't have to have my stuff shipped over the course of five mm-hmm. or 10 days. I don't have to do any of those things. You can have all your food grown two miles away in a warehouse and delivered to Publix. Or so that's, that's a supermarket chain in Florida. So yeah. delivered to the supermarket and it's delivered like, the, a day after or a few hours after it's picked and it costs and it's it's it is produced at 80 percent with, with all of these things that we don't want in, in the foods and it's produced right down the road and it doesn't right cost all, the, all yeah. the different things all the um amazing you know, amazing yeah. yeah but but they were saying like yeah we're trying to get legislation yeah and they, and they the guy that did the article said the same thing though well, the farmer that he was talking to he said the same thing they were like why isn't this being subsidized or what and he said yeah, well, the industry, the farm industry, is just massive, and it's just yeah. too big, and they're they're yep. we're, we're they're crushing us. It, and it's really the farm not, bill, the farm bill, the farm yeah. bill. Yeah, so I've heard of it. A lot of people don't know how big the farm bill is, and the way I describe it is the farm bill is a war on animals and the environment because it it literally is nearly as much as our military spending. And a lot of people are concerned about the military industrial complex and how much money we use in wars. Certainly, you know, the war in Iraq was, by all accounts, a complete waste of money and just 
not just a waste of money, but a c- catastrophe for the people who died. Um, the Farm Bill is a war on the environment and animals. It comes to the tune of hundreds of billions, with a B, of taxpayer dollars going to subsidize big industry. Right. So one of the richest men in China, uh, Wan Long, he owns Smithfield Foods, the largest pig factory farm in the nation. He doesn't need more money. He's already a billionaire. He's one of the richest people in the world. He sits around in a mansion while all these pigs are being tortured. His company alone, one company, the Washington Post estimated they received $600 million in straight up handoffs through the farm bill. They just give them $600 million. I'd love to have $600 million. I needed a lot more than Wen Lung does. I'd rather you have it. I'd rather anyone have it than this guy, honestly. He's right. not even a U.S. citizen. He's a billionaire in China. And he makes $600 million. And what is that money going to? It's going to things like factory farms, fur farms, laboratories, all sorts of disgusting things that most people could not even stomach watch. Right? And so when you ask, well, why don't we have a, a plant-based food system or an alternative agricultural system where we have vertical farming, sustainable farming? A big part of it is these incumbent players have a stranglehold of our food system. And they have so much power and influence in the politics that no one is willing to challenge them. And that's when the grassroots comes into play and where you use dramatic storytelling and direct action and, and nonviolence. Nonviolence is crucial. Everything we do is nonviolent. But when, when the government is asleep at the wheel, when the system is fundamentally broken, Ordinary people need to take direct action. And that is the history of this country. That is what the founding fathers in 1776, because they were part of a broken system too. And they said, enough is enough. We're going to do something different. And and that's and what we're trying to do. And we've had thousands of people participate, you know, and um, and I think one of the reasons they're prosecuting is so hard and trying to send me to prison for such a long period of time is because it's working. Because people are interested, not just interested, but they're actually participating in the demonstrations and the advocacy and listening to these stories and blown away by the amount of corruption in our food system and not just our food system, but our, our pharmaceutical industry, our animal testing industry and our clothing industries. And they want change. Right. Well, so your point of view didn't get you arrested. What, what got you arrested? What, what happened there? Um, so I've been arrested many times at this point. So, uh, and, and you're a lawyer. Like, have you lost your license? They tried like, to. You... I literally this morning, <laughs> I kid you not, this morning I got an order indicating they're going to try and suspend my license on March 18th. So like basically a month from today. Uh, and they've tried many times so far. They haven't removed my license. Do, do you so, have a hearing? Do you have to go to a hearing? And explain yeah, I've got to go to a hearing, which I'm not going to be able to go to because I'm going on trial in Wisconsin, but. What has gotten me arrested is is challenging both the lack of transparency and the abuse of animals by taking direct action, just by trying to help animals. And so the trial of coming up in a month involves a blind beagle puppy who was so tormented that and lived in a cage that was just about twice the length of her own body her entire life. But she was so tormented that she was just spinning in her cage over many hours. That's all she could do. She couldn't get out. She had no stimulation, no companionship. She was suffering from multiple maladies inside the cage, no individualized attention or veterinary care. And all we did was we saw this tormented being, um, and I can you know show you the video and photos. It's just demonstrably the case that this, this beagle was suffering from torment. We took her to the vet. That's what I did. But an in industry that is based on cruelty, so we took her out of the cage, we took her out into the dark in the middle of the night and we took her to the vet. And I've now been charged with felony burglary and theft, facing 16 years in prison for taking this beagle puppy to the vet. Yeah. Whoa. So, but for, and you might ask, how is this possible? Because, uh, and it's not just this case. I mean, there have been dozens of FBI agents across the country that have mobilized to try and prosecute me specifically. There have been dozens of FBI agents who cross state lines trying to chase down animals and rescue. It's almost like some sort of ridiculous you know, sci-fi comedy where right. like, like, don't they have better things to do? Yeah. Don't they have better things? And one of the things to note is these dogs are rescued from this experimentation facility or the pigs we rescued from that Smithfield factory farm owned by the billionaire in China. In all of these cases, these animals don't even have any value because they're so sick. They're so broken that they cannot be sold anymore. At least legally, they should not be sold. Um, so, and you know, I'm sure you and the people in, in your audience have probably had something stolen from them at some point in their life. 
you know, like a wallet, an iPhone, whatever it is, a bike. I dare you to call the FBI and try and convince not just one agent, but dozens of agents to go across the country searching for your wallet, which clearly that wallet probably was worth a lot more than this puppy, worth a lot more than those sick piglets you're rescuing from factory clumps. But well, this I is an even, example. I, even then, I even if you said, hey, you got your stuff stole, would you like the FBI to track this guy down? Sure. If they said, hey, you know, if this guy gets caught, he's going to get 15 or 16 years, I'd be like, oh, yeah, listen, it's not that important. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll cancel my credit cards, bro. Yeah, like, like, I, I wouldn't be okay there. with sending someone to prison for 15 or 16 years because, you know, they yeah, broke So Utah uh, involving two big lists, both of whom are <laughs> clearly dying on the brink of death. And the company didn't even know to remove them because this is a company that at that one facility, one facility, we talked about 15,000 being a lot of cows. This one farm, it's not even a farm, it's a huge industrial facility, processes 1.2 million pigs every year. Circle mm -hmm. four farms in Southern Utah. They didn't even know we took these piglets because they got 1.2 million pigs, two sick piglets are not, I mean, it's, a round, it's not even a rounding error. It's like, it's, it's a rounding error for a rounding error. That's how small and significant it is. Uh, they didn't even know we removed these animals from this facility. And again, there's a federal terrorism investigation that starts. They accuse us of terrorism. And in, in trial and in testimony, dozens of FBI agents involved. And we went to trial. The prosecutor was asking for five years in prison for this, for two pig rods. We did no other damage. They didn't even know we were there until months later. And, and you said you're not in jail because of your beliefs. Kind of, but kind of not because... The fundamental reason they're upset, and the CEO of Costco got involved in this. He was involved in our prosecution. You might wonder why. And it's because we basically got into the New York Times with a lot of critical coverage of Costco and some of the most important corporations in the nation and how they're lying to the public about giving freedom to animals. Um, and so, you know, yeah, they, they asked for five years, and thankfully we won that case. But, you know, I've got another case coming up in less than a month. March 18th is when the trial starts. If we lose case, this case, I would guess the prosecution asked for at least um, a few years. I don't know. But the, the biomedical industry is extremely powerful. And they are concerned about these demonstrations. They're concerned about these rescues. And they want deterrence. So mm. that's where we are. Um, I'm sorry. I hate to say this. It's, it's just, what was, what's the charge? It's felony burglary and felony theft because they're claiming these dogs are worth more than twenty five hundred dollars. Still, it would that's just an embarrassing charge. You can't go to prison with that charge. You can't go to prison yeah. with with uh, for you know for uh, breaking into a um, uh, to an animal facility like that's it's yeah. like that's not a, that's just you know what I'm saying it's like you know it's like, oh my God, that's just a ridiculous charge to go into prison with. People would be like, that's not so, true. You go, yeah, no, it's true. You would hope not. But, um, and again, you can look into this. I have a friend who spent five years in prison primarily for running a website against animal experimentation. Her name is Lauren Gazzola, and it was a, a campaign called Stop Hunting Animal Cruelty. And they got her on a conspiracy charge because other people broke into the lab and took animals out and smashed it up. And she didn't do it, and the prosecution didn't even let she did it. She just reported on it as right. an activist, and they charged her with conspiracy. She ended up in jail for five years. Prison, wow. federal prison. Did she go to trial? She went to trial and she lost. Yeah, they so they... So, right, well, I was going to say she could have taken a plea, but um, that, that's what I meant was... Um, mm -hmm. So she went to trial, and because they... she didn't do it. Right. But, and so they just connected her saying, no, you did. They allege that she knew it was going to happen or she was in contact with the people prior to, cause I don't see how you could be in a conspiracy after the fact. Um, yeah, you can't be in a conspiracy after the fact, or at least you cannot be held liable for the conduct of the conspiracy until you've joined it. Uh, but the prosecution alleged that she was part of a conspiracy, even with unknown co-conspirators. Um, and because she was running this website that was encouraging and supporting people for doing these forms of direct actions, she was liable for it. Yeah, that's um, There's a lot of really good reporting on this uh, from back in the mid-2000s, but it, it's, it's true. And you know, this is a young woman who graduated magna cum laude from NYU. She was on her way to law school, had a beautiful and um, important life ahead of her, and had a lot to contribute to society and set, and set it up in federal prison for five years. 
Um, yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah, that's the problem with conspiracy. A lot of people think, oh, conspiracy, that's like the three of us get together and talk about robbing a bank. No, no, that can be that I'm selling drugs to Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And then Jimmy goes and sells drugs to Tom. And then Tom goes to sell drugs and gets into, gets into an argument with the guy and shoots him. Kills him. Yep. And I get charged with a murder. And you go, yeah, but I didn't know anything. I don't even know. I don't even know that guy. I sold to him. He sold him. Doesn't matter. I didn't know he had a gun. I didn't know. Doesn't matter. Conspiracy. The left hand doesn't have to know what the right hand is. It's a really absolutely right. Fucked up law. No, there are a lot of first amendment scholars and it's, it's, it's fraud because a lot of it is just expressive activity. It's just, you know, we're talking to each other and I say, because the, the elements of conspiracy that have to be proven in most states is just an agreement in some act in furtherance of that agreement. So if you and I agree and we say like, yeah, you know, it, it's so messed up that people are torturing these beagles. Someone should just break in there. You know, don't you think someone should do it? It's like, yeah, let's, someone should do it. And it could be that potentially vague. And then as long as I take some act in furtherance of that agreement, and that act could be a completely legal action. It could be I sharpened someone's pencil so they could draft a plan. It could be I ran a website uh, talking about how important it is for people to do direct action. And then as you noted, even if someone does something outside of the scope of your agreement, you know, as long as it's a reasonably foreseeable uh, consequence of your agreement and the prosecution can prove that, you're guilty of it too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe I agreed to just a drug deal. But the prosecution says, well, it's reasonably foreseeable that somebody could pull a gun and shoot somebody. Yeah. And and that's what your co-conspirator did. So you're not guilty of murder. And I thought, wait, I just I just thought I was signing on a pot deal. And I wasn't even directly doing it. I just thought, like, yeah, I'm glad you're selling pot. Let me give you my pencil so you can write down the amounts of money or the amounts of pot that you need to actually bring to the deal. Um, well, I've now agreed to the conspiracy. I've taken an act in furtherance of it because I gave you a pencil that you wrote down the amount of pot you're supposed to bring. And now I'm being charged of murder. And that's kind of what I, happened to Lauren. I knew a guy that got lumped into a conspiracy because it was a real estate conspiracy. Actually, the FBI showed up at some of his co-defendants houses and to ask questions, knocked on the door. He opened the door and they, they were like, listen, man, the FBI just came by and start, started telling him what was going on. Now they were wired, by the way. And he goes, he goes man, he said, um, bro, if I was you, I'd get a lawyer. I wouldn't talk to him at all. I'd get a lawyer obstruction of justice they hit him with wow he's like i suggested that they I said no you, get a lawyer. you suggested they were saying you suggested them um you know obstructing justice justice so he got wow. hit with that like, conspiracy to obstruct justice by yeah. telling them not to talk to him and get a lawyer yeah. but he was yeah, like that which was, is right yeah but he also took a plea by the way he took a plea because he was scared and he got a public defender yeah. and the public defender was like listen i know what you're thinking you just told them about what their constitutional right is but when they get in front of a jury they're not going to yeah, play in it that not. way and he was scared and he got a couple of years for it and yeah I, i've heard i mean i could you know there, i've got two or three other ridiculous examples yeah uh, of the same thing where they just threw someone into a conspiracy because they were like nah you same thing i had a guy one time he got two or three years because which actually was an FBI agent it was, or a DEA agent was wired up and was came yeah. to a drug deal. They went to this guy's house. He's like, he's not selling drugs, but the drug dealer was there. So they, the other drug dealer brought this guy, the FBI inf- or the DEA informant to the house. And while he's yeah. sitting on the couch and they're talking about the drug deal, he said, listen, man, you don't know him. Mm-hmm. And he goes, and I'm telling you right now, he said, that guy looks like a cop yeah. and you don't know him. He's I wouldn't sell him nothing. When they eventually yeah. bust him, his name got thrown in. Yep. Just wow. because he said that. Because he said, don't sell them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, there's so many yeah, cases. It's ridiculous. It He's so subtle. That's why, and I get contacted, not so much anymore, but I used to get contacted all the time where guys are like, hey, um, can I talk to you? And I was okay. like, uh, uh, yeah, can, can we get on the phone and talk? Or I could come see you, man. I just want you to answer some questions. I, I, I've got someone yeah. doing, you know, eventually you realize, okay, they're talking about, they've got some kind of scam or a fraud that they're doing. Yep. And I'm like, no. And they're like, yeah, no, you no, don't have to do anything. No. I'm like, no, you know, no, just, just hear me out. I said, I don't want to hear you out because I said, do you understand that just yeah. me hearing you out? I'm already indicted. And they were like, yep. why is that? I said, because when you get indicted, they're going to search your phone. They're going to find yep. my information. They're going to find out that you talked to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I said, it's I, up. Right. I've been indicted. They're going to throw me in into the conspiracy. I yep. said, and I'm done. I said, Eve, if I contribute in any way to your crime, I'm going to be a part of that conspiracy. No, but you, well, what if you don't get any money or if it, it doesn't matter? It's not doesn't about matter. money. Yeah. 
Yeah, you don't have to receive any benefit from it as long right. as you agree. People don't understand that. Right? Yeah, it's, it's scary. It, people don't understand how completely messed up our own government is and how much our criminal justice system just railroads people in the yeah. most. And, and like occasionally you hear a story that gives you some sense of how messed up it is, but the scale of it is just unfathomable. Um, and I really mean unfathomable because we got millions of people locked up in this country, right? It's like 1.7 million. So it's almost 2 million people, which is far higher than almost any other country in the world. I mean, we complain about all these dictatorships that are locking people up like Russia and Navalny. And we don't realize, you know, our per capita rate of incarceration, I think, is higher than any other medium sized or large country in the world. No, we, have we have six have... times higher rate of car- incarceration in the United States than communist China. Xi Jinping is a brutal dictator who's crushed his own people. And we lock up six times as many people in this country. So let's condemn Xi Jinping in China for sure. That is a messed up government screwing a lot of people. Our government is messed up and screwing a lot of people too. And it's not living up to our constitutional ideals. Yeah, but we have better marketing. <laughs> That's really what it is. It really is. You know, that's what it comes down to. Like home of the, you know, home of the, uh, what is it? Home of the brave land of the free. Or yeah. from, you know, I mean, it's like, it's yeah. like from the, from the get go, it's built in. They, they it's good marketing. Good. Yeah, it is. Maybe so. And then all these Maybe programs so. that make it seem like, you know, like yeah. I love law and order where, where Jim McCoy finds, I think it's Jim McCoy. He finds out that he convicted the wrong person and he wakes up the cops in the middle of the night and they go to the prison and they 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 want to get the guy out immediately. They stop it, bro. That's not what they do. No. They dig their heels and they fight tooth and nail to keep innocent people in jail over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, I don't know. I I, I'm hope hopefully this works out. You know, you're gonna go so you're gonna go to trial. Going to trial. March eighteenth it starts. Oh my God. Now, I, I listen, you know, that this is funny because I, I, I've talked to people all the time that either have been to trial or about to go to trial and, you know, they're, and they'll ask like my advice and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to me, and you know, you don't need my advice, but here's what scares the hell out of me is that if you're guilty, you're 100% going to be found guilty. If you're innocent, you've got about a 50% chance of being found guilty. That's the problem. Yeah. People are like, well, yeah, but I didn't Remember? do anything. If only it worked yeah. like that. Yeah, you I know. know. Um, and then, of course, yeah, it's you're... funny because we have a constitutional presumption of innocence, but the way the system works, you don't actually get it. No, you I actually do not get it. Had a, a guy I was locked up with, which was guilty, but uh, during his trial, it, he said it's funny because during voir dire, they were going around asking all, you know, can you, do you feel you can look at the evidence and find him, you know, not guilty and be or be open minded, whatever the, the term is. And mm-hmm. the guy goes, uh, I don't know. He did something. And they went, they go, what? He said, he goes, he was indicted on 37 counts of wire fraud. He goes, he's guilty of something. Mm-hmm. And wow. my, the guy I knew, who was obviously the, the defendant, he said, like, I hey, appreci- that guy needs out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what he said was, I appreciated him saying that. Saying that. He, wow. said, he said, because he just said what every yeah, member wow, of the jury saying. already yeah. thought. Correct. And he said, at least they kicked him, you know, loose. He said, but everybody yeah. else, and keep in mind, this is a guy that for, I don't know, like half a day, all the prosecution did was now, keep in mind, this is a bunch of people that couldn't get themselves out of jury duty and probably yeah. are all, you know, middle class or lower middle class and are struggling with their bills. Yep. And they put my, my buddy was on the stand for half the day where all the prosecution did was go through all the checks and money he had right. spent in the last five years. What's this check for? I don't know. When okay. we went to Las Vegas, and, and what's this meal for? Well, you spent thirty seven hundred dollars. What's that for? Uh, we lost to the casino. What about this? This is six hundred and fifty dollars. He's like, we went to dinner at such and such. Oh, well, okay. what about this? Oh, well, that eleven thousand. That was a vacation. We went for a week to such and such. So, oh, how much was your Mercedes again? How much was the the Bentley? How much was the house? Wow. For, he said for half the day. He said, listen. He said by the time. They were done going over all the money and all the expenses and everything. He's like, I could look at the jury and tell these people hated my guts. Hated you. Yeah. Right. Because they're struggling right now. And now they're even in, in more yeah. str- struggling and harder because now they just had to take a week off of off of work to get paid yeah. 30 bucks a day or whatever they're reimbursed. This, you know, and this guy, he's like, like, I get it. Like I, I was sitting there yeah. looking at these people thinking, Jesus, man, this guy, like, because I paid a hundred dollars for a steak 
in Vegas. Now I got to go to prison for, you know, 17 yep. years or whatever. And what's funny is too, he was offered like three years. You know how often yeah. they'll get offered two or three years and then they go, no, mm -hmm. fuck that. I'm going to go to trial. And their lawyer will tell them like, look, they can only really convict you of this and you'll get five years. Then they get found guilty and the guy mm -hmm. gets 17 years. It's like, you wow. said, you said the most they could convict me. It was like, oh, I know. But during the trial, they proved this and proved this. And I didn't realize that this and, and that, you're done. No, you know, multiple you guys were all over years. Yeah, they got 15 years, 20 yeah. years, 17 years, 19 years. I knew a guy that got 19 years. They had offered him two years. Yeah. And you know what? The, one of the worst things is all these long sentences we're throwing people in jail for, including yours, frankly. There's no evidence that it actually deters crime. There's been a no. lot of studies of this that you send people to jail longer, it wastes a lot of taxpayer money for nothing. It doesn't well, you, deter any crime. Their argument is it removes them from society. So I, I understand. Yeah. And it does. But here's the thing. Like, if I had been in prison for four years, mm -hmm. four, within four or five years, listen, I knew one thing for sure. I'm better off sleeping in someone's spare room, working a minimum wage job than coming Traveling back to the jail. And I'm okay yeah, with that. I agree. I didn't need to get a 26-year sentence. I didn't yeah. need to, to do 13 years to learn that. Yeah. So so I, I, I definitely think, I think you could cut these sentences by... 66 percent yeah and give these guys all the value yeah well and give these guys incentive to you know train them train yeah. you know tell them look you got to pass this class you got you got to pass this course before you know or you don't get your 60 percent good time you're going to do your whole yeah. 15 years you want to get out in five pass this class take this course you know and and you'll get out you get your good time you'll be out in five years like at least most of these guys get out and they have no marketable skills. They've been drug dealers yep. their whole life. What are they going to do now? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I can work at Walmart. Unlikely. Yeah. 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 Was your experience in jail? Because my experience, I've been to prison, but I've been in jail many times. And every time I've been in jail, probably the defining experience of jail is that no one actually gives a shit about you or anyone else there. Right. <laughs> they just treat everyone like shit. And in particular, this idea, oh, we're trying to correct this bad behavior and we want to rehabilitate people and make them into no. better people. There, I didn't even get, I didn't even get a glimpse of that anytime. Did you how, ever how feel long, that? How long were you locked up? So I was, this stay was only 38 days, which is my only stay. But I've been in jail, you know, a couple dozen times, but only for like one or two nights. But every time I've been there, I've never felt like, and I, I know prison supposedly is a little better. There's a little more kind of, you know, the more programs and rehabilitation efforts. But the most distinctive feature of jail for me is just how everyone just does not give a damn about you or anyone else there. You're just yeah. scum. You know, they don't like you. Yeah. I always say it's a great equalizer. Like it doesn't matter if you're a, if you're a, a billionaire True. or you're, you're, um, yep. you're, you're raising the projects, you're going to be treated just the same. You're okay, all yeah, garbage. You're still, you, everyone's a piece of shit. Doesn't and matter. jail is worse than prison. You know, jail is always worse. So if you went to prison yeah. and for a crime like yours, you, and in Cal, are you in California? I'm in California, yeah. Okay. California, you'd go straight to a camp. Yeah. In in, in the district in on the East Coast, most of the time they send you to a low security prison, mm -hmm. which is not is just above a camp. Like it's not a big deal. Good. It's uh, mostly nonviolent, and so you'll you'd go straight to a camp. The problem is you guys have a lot of cartel members and gang yep. related stuff there that they don't have that much on the East Coast, and and there's all there are programs. You know, they're behind you, you sign up and maybe two years later you get into the program to learn how to lay drywall yeah. or learn how to be a, I don't know about carpet electrician. I know they have electrician programs. They have, uh, um, they have, uh, uh, shoot how to be, I forget the name of it. Shit. Like to be a farmer. I figure what they call that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they have a yeah, uh, horticulture you know, program or something. Hort horticulture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Horticulture. They have, you know, how to basically run a restaurant, how to, yeah. which is, you know, some of them are good, like. And there are some computer programs where they try and teach you like windows and things, but honestly, what? you're not, you're really watching a video cause they won't let you interact yep, yeah. on the computer and, and you're, you're learning on like windows 95 or something like it's, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they have the program to say, oh, we have a program and that, that meets the requirement and then they get funding and then whoever goes away, they don't realize like the program that you're teaching is a video on an outdated, um, you know, app or service or whatever. It's like, that's yep. not, you're not teaching anything. 
Um, it's really up to you as the individual to try and figure out the, the staff is not going to help you. Help and you. I know yeah. guys that have gotten college degrees, but they That's also, awesome. they also had almost no help from the staff and maybe they had some advocate on the outside that helped them and they, they you know, and you're limited on what you can get, you mm -hmm. know, you're not going to get anything in, in the sciences or anything. You might get something and, you know, um, yeah. you know, something more, um, I don't know, art based or, uh, um, it's more of a B you're probably going to get like a BA and something not like, a. um, yep. But anyway, yeah, it's totally up to you, but the low, like lows and, and camps are not that there's not violence. It's more okay. like a rough high school, but honestly, you know, you keep your head down and, and there's very, you know, you hear these horror stories, you know, people getting stabbed and getting beat mm -hmm. up and it's that. But the truth is that if you get hurt in prison or attacked or stabbed or beat up, you brought it on yourself. Yourself. Yeah. That's what very I heard. seldom does that ha just randomly happen. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, the pe what gets people in trouble is one, they gossip about other people. Mm -hmm. Inmates are like old, old, an old yep. woman sewing uh, circle. Yeah, they hate it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you don't, you know, so you be, be polite. Don't gossip. Uh, don't gamble. Don't run mm -hmm. up debts. Don't borrow anything. You know, more, don't. More. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that, that get people in trouble. And, and honestly, once you've been there two, uh, uh, two months or so, you yeah. get a little click, a little group of guys that you kind of know. And the next thing you know, you've got a little, little circle of friends and you kind of mm -hmm. stick within that circle and the time start, you know, you get on a routine and you know, before you know it, your sentence, you start, you look up and it's been six months and you look up again and it's been a year and it's, you know, and there are, there are good people in, in prison. Absolutely. Um, you know, there are really are, good people in prison. Yeah, and there are horrific people in prison too, but yeah, there yeah, are good sure. people. But it's not like you're like, oh, I'm surrounded by horrible people. Man, there's some, what you know, the worst thing is the guys that are in there for drugs, because you'll see them without the drugs and they're normal people. And I've Why seen not? multiple people, you know, they're like, oh yeah, I was hooked on oxys. Oh, okay. And then they'll tell you their story. And it's like, it's, 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 it's outlandish yeah. and horrific. And you're like, oh my God, you can't believe you did that. Like, I know I couldn't believe yeah. Yeah. You know, now that I'm sober, I can't believe yeah, it either. I can. Yeah. And then they leave. And then two years later, they come back. Back. Yeah. And they've they done another back. wild, crazy thing. They got back on drugs. They came back. They got no treatment when they were there. Mm -hmm. You know, they get out, they come back. They're like, oh God, you won't believe what happened. I'm, I'm assuming you got back on drugs. Oh, you can't believe you're not going to believe this. I got new yeah. charges. I got six years this time. You're like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But Which yeah, you're so hear sad because it's, it's, I mean, there's enormous amount of scientific research showing now that addiction is, is actually the disease. There's right. some people who just literally cannot prevent themselves from using drugs if they're even remotely available. Like there's literally brain wiring that prevents them. Like I, uh, I got a family member, uh, not close family member who was addicted to heroin. And, you know, there's some people's brains who just have a propensity for this sort of addiction. And she, she just turned into kind of a demon where like, I mean, everywhere she went, she just stole everything because she needed to feed her drug habit. So like lock in your house, all your stuff's gone. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's almost like a machine that's just taking over this living creature and she can't stop. Um, and I know that that was true. of The two things that define every inmate I talked to when I was in jail, one was addiction. Even the ones who were not in on some drug related crime. You know, like my my cellmate, my celly was in on grand theft, but he was in on grand theft because he was addicted to meth, and he was yeah, on yeah. meth when he stole the car. So it's like, I think just about a hundred percent of the people I talked to had some sort of drug problem. That was part of the reason they were in jail. And the second reason, which is also really not people's fault, is loneliness. Like there were a ton of just really disconnected people who didn't have family, they didn't have a support network, they had no one to be accountable to. Or, or would hold them accountable, right? And and so they're just lost. And it's really sad because we should be helping people who are lonely and addicted to drugs, not throwing them in the cages. Because I just, I don't see any value in it. And I'll, I'll just give you one concrete example. Uh, you're right, California does have some gangs. You know, half of the, the cell block in, in my jail was controlled by uh, Mexican gangs. There were the Nortenas and the, I forget what they're called, but two gangs basically. 
and the controlled half of the cell block. Um, and I think it was in like day two or three, there was a fight that broke out in the entire jail, not just our block, but the entire jail went on lockdown because uh, a, a drunk gang member slowed your cop and everything got shut down. And so we're not allowed to come out of our cells at all for like two days after that. And they searched everything. It was a huge catastrophe. And given this is a pretty violent place and we just had a violent episode, you might think that the jail would be interested in interventions that would reduce violence, like meditation. There's a lot of evidence that meditation helps you have emotional self-control. I'm a huge meditator. I believe in our trained and guided people in meditations for most of the last 10 years. And so I just asked the the COs in my jail after the staff, hey, how would you feel if I just did a meditation in the corner every day? And they said, absolutely not. You're not allowed to do that. Because <laughs> that's organizing. You know, It's like, so they wouldn't let me even meditate with other people. Um, and it just shows you how broken the system is because it's just, look, you got all this violence and you've got you know these people who desperately need, whether it's mental health support, you know, meditation, social support, and we don't give them anything they actually need to get better. And even when it has no cost to the state and you've got someone in the, who's a trained meditator, and I'm Buddhist and I've done this, and I've done this with lots of people, and I, I think we could have helped some of those people with meditation. And they're like, no, you can't do that because it's not in the rules. And anytime there's a group of people doing something, they're scared. Yeah. Yeah. They don't like, they don't like organizing. I I was going to say, it's funny. Like you go to, let's say you made drugs legal, Mm -hmm. you know, where they'd become extremely inexpensive. You know, they're, they're regulated, they're super inexpensive and you tax them and you take that money and you put that into drug rehabs, which seems funny because people are like, why not just make drugs illegal? Stop it. You're not going to get rid of them. So stop, figure out something else. So open up drug rehabs that are free and then reduce the prison population or the sentences by 66%. Yeah, absolutely. 60%, 70%. Billions of dollars, billions of dollars. Say And take a percentage of that, just a percentage and put that into drug rehabs. Now, when people say I have a problem, they can go sign into a drug rehab that doesn't seem like a halfway house. That's a decent, Mm -hmm. clean, well-run half uh, um, drug treatment center that they can check into for 30 days or 60 or 90 days. And then they can get clean, help uh, have a support system, help get them back on their feet somehow. You know, even if you have to put that on and say, look, it cost us, we spent $25,000. We're going to put that on your credit. You're going to have to make payments. And we're going to give you six months to like your student loans, six months, you're in a house, you've got a job, six months to start making payments, zero interest rate, whatever. Make it like a student loan. You can't bankrupt it. You can't get rid of it. Okay. You know, I'm not saying there's not, it's, it's just free housing and and therapy, but how much, if you did the math, the amount of money money the government would save and be helping people as opposed to saying, here, you're going to jail for 15 years and we're going to let you out with virtually no money put you yep. in a halfway house tell. And now I have to turn around and I have to go apply for jobs and tell people that I'm yep. a convicted felon. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and I got to work. I have no car. I have no clothes. Like when I got out of prison, I had like two sweat, two pairs of sweatpants and like four t-shirts. Yeah. You know, like if somebody hadn't given me 400 bucks, I wouldn't have been able to like literally Couple, about two days after I got to the halfway house, I went to Walmart and spent 300 bucks on clothes. I bought an entire, oh, wow. my entire wardrobe with 300 bucks and wore those. By the way, didn't buy anything else. That's not true. I went to Marshall's and I bought wow. a white long sleeve shirt about, about four months or five months after I got out of prison because I had to go do a, a, a like a show. And I did buy a, sh- a black shirt. That's it. And you know what Marshall's is? Do you know what Marshall's is? Yeah. No, it's like yeah. super cheap. It is like, it was like 12 bucks. It's like 12 bucks. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So like literally bought almost no, clo- no new clothes for, and, and still have a couple of the pair of blue jeans upstairs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you still and, have the jeans from when you just oh, yeah. got out of prison. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I met my wife. In do, the do, do you still wear them? Yeah, of course. That's awesome. Course. That's so I, cool. I met my wife in the halfway house. Wow. She did five years for a meth conspiracy. And wow. what's funny is, you know, I lived in someone's spare room and she lived at her lived in her dad's spare room. So, you know, we didn't want to go mm-hmm. over there to see each other. So I, we would get like a hotel room. I remember mm-hmm. one time because when you go to the halfway house, typically you're carrying your stuff around everywhere, right? Like you have a yeah. locker, but a lot of time, like you're going to go to work, yep. you want to change clothes, you want to come back, you want, you know, so you, everybody tends to buy these black 
book bags. Mm -hmm. Or I would say book bag. What are they? She calls them something else. Backpack, a backpack. Sure. Mm -hmm. So we went to a hotel, met at a hotel one time. She got out of her truck. I got out of my little Jeep. They're both piece of garbage cars. We pull in, we get out. We both walk out with our black backpack. And this is months after we'd been out of the halfway house. And I go, you still got your black, your backpack? She goes, you do. And I said, well, yeah. Said, you know. <laughs> and so we walk, we walk upstairs and we put our stuff down and I opened my, we both opened our backpack to kind of pull out some clothes, right? We both kind of come from work and we both at Coleman, the prison I was at, they sell a, um, you know, uh, I forget what you, what you want to call this, a uh, amenities kit or something. Um, mm -hmm. basically like where you would put your your soap and your, your yep. hairspray and your, maybe your, um, uh, you know, your, your shampoo, but it's a clear plastic bag. That's maybe mm -hmm, 12 mm -hmm. inches. It's like a little bag with a zipper, but it's clear so that the guards can see through it. So everything's clear in prison. So what's funny is we both end up unzipping our black backpack and pull out our plastic kits and sit them down. She goes, you still have your, whatever she called it, makeup kit or whatever. I was like, yeah, I was like, well, I mean, it, it's still, it's fine. It's a, she's like, no, me too. I get it. And, um, listen, we both just burst out laughing. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, like I'm, we're, bro I'm broke. I'm like, I'm starting over. I don't have time. To, I can't go buy a new, nice little kit. I'm not buying a nice duffel bag. This is yeah. worked and I'm broke, but yeah. you know, it was just, it's super, it was super funny how many things like that, you know, wearing the same t-shirt that you wore for Yep. You know, I listen, I still, I, I had, I, I don't think I have them anymore, but I, I had some of the white t-shirts that I had in prison. Right. I, I had them. I wore them for years afterwards. Why? Cause they worked and I'm saving money and I'm starting over and I don't care what you think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, when I was in jail, the only, I think clothing you're allowed to buy was underwear and I didn't buy any. I was too cheap. The the I got three pairs. That's going to be enough. Yeah. Well, you're thinking I'm probably out of here soon. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I wasn't sure. The, the max sentence I could have been given was six years, and that ended up giving me 90 days. And I served 38 based on time served. So, yeah, I, it's pretty wild. I mean, it's it's kind of mind blowing. I mean, I, it makes me feel very lucky, honestly, that I've got friends and family who supported me when I came out because I didn't have to go through all the hardship. I mean, I had a place to stay, I had a car, I had all the things I needed. Um, yeah, but for a lot of people, it's, it's that's not true. And it's inconceivable. I mean, honestly, your story is kind of mind blowing that you were able to bounce back from that and get to where you are today. Congrats to you, my friend, because you're you're the rare success story among all the people who are incarcerated. Mostly yeah, what I've I, seen from people who are incarcerated is it breaks them and they're they come out. You can understand why someone goes back to crime and drugs when they've taken everything from you and you have no know. other sources of work. That's all they know. Right. Well, I also think the problem is a lot of people are not long term thinkers. Like, you know, they think, oh, well, I need $5,000 for this. I'll, I don't have, how am I going to, I get paid this much a week. I'll never, I'll never have $5,000. Like, wait, wait a minute. You can, if yeah. you put, you know, you put whatever, $17 a, a day away and you know what I'm saying? Or what, you know, you start yeah. adding it like, and they, but they can't realize that, Hey, in five months, I'll have five grand. They don't think yeah. like that. They, they, they just can't see that far. Most people, most people are paycheck people. They, mm -hmm. they see mm -hmm. a week a day, maybe a month, but they don't, they don't think annually. They certainly don't think within, you know, decades. So, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm lucky because I I'm, you know, I, I do think that way. And, and I also listen, my, my priorities or my priorities had shifted dramatically in prison. Yeah. And I, I had, you know, I was very thankful for anything I had and I, and I was, beca and I came out, although I'm, I'm still arrogant, I, I became much more humble. Like, <laughs> Yeah. I realized being in prison, like it's better to be yeah. renting someone's spare room. I'll rent yeah, someone's you're not spare room. Yep. Right. I don't need all those things. All those things that I thought were so important are not important. Yeah. So what caused that? What do you think made you humble? Was it just kind of the equalizing effect of being around all these you people who are considered the lowest of the low? Yeah. I mean, and, and I think what was funny was that all the people and friends and family that I had when I went in that pretty much not all of them. I mean, my mom was there, you know, and I had one or two yeah. friends that came, you know, came to visit me, but most of those people, the people that I really gave the most to, yeah. you know, like you, you made a million dollars off of, off of me and my scam through you I, ha, within two years, you were given half a million dollars, you know, for this guy, this guy made hundreds of thousands of dollars. those people abandoned me. Those people wow. that I thought were my good friends, you start to, it, I think you just kind of reprior prioritize 
and you're around people all day that are, you know, you're around a bunch of hustlers that just want to get something out of you, right? They're, they're scumbags. Mm -hmm. And you start to realize that you get a group of friends that don't want to be anything but friends. It was probably the first time in my life. I had guys that wanted to hang out just to talk, just to hang out. Wow. Just to hang out where everybody else I'd ever hung out with. It was about business and how could we make money? How yeah. can you help me make money? How can I help you make, how can we help each other make money? How can we, well, that was no longer the case. So then you just start getting people that are just hanging out with you because they like you and doing things for you because they're interested in what you're doing. Like I started writing guys stories. So guys are helping me do research on the stories for no reason. Yeah. Wow. You know, just because they thought what I was doing was cool and they liked to see that in three months you'd hand them a 12 pages and they'd read this 8,000 word story and they'd be like, wow, man, wow. this is amazing. Yeah. And oh my gosh. And, and, and they're in, in a way they're like, and I helped contribute to this. I did a lot of the research, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, I think that was that, that it was, it was just a shift that, and I've, I say this all the time is that I have a buddy, Pete, who says, um, who said, you know, you can't go to prison thinking the same way that led you to prison and get out of prison you know, and not, not go back. You know, you, you yeah. can't, you can't leave prison with the same, the same thought process that led you there and not expect to come back. You have yep. to change something. And the sooner really a, and a part of that was the sooner you realize that nobody put you there, you put you there. You're mm -hmm. the, as soon as you start realizing this is all my fault. Yeah. You know, that, that fundamentally changed, you know, my thought process was like, nobody put me here, but me. I'm the reason I'm here. And most guys don't do that. Most guys spend their whole bid yeah. blaming other people. And resentful. Yeah. yeah, this guy snitched on me. This guy's a piece of garbage. I never had a chance. I never this. I never that. Well, you know, and some yeah. of that may be true, but you're here now and none of that's helping you. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, no, I, I definitely sensed a lot of that when I was in prison. And it's, it's hard. So I, I so do have. have you found yourself after you've got out of jail? Have you been able to kind of transform your relationships now so that they're you've surrounded yourself with people who actually just care about you instead of trying to get something out of you? Have you been oh, yeah. able to Oh yeah. And I'm very honest up front. Like I, I I'll yeah. if somebody's dealing with me or saying something, I'm like, listen, I can't pay you anything. Yeah. If you're doing this, you're doing this out of the goodness of your own heart. Heart, yeah. Um, you know, I I'm not in a listen, even like people will come and and they'll fly in to be to do the podcast in person. Yeah. You know, they'll, they'll say, Hey man, listen, I'm going to fly in. Do you, you know, can you reimburse me for my plane ticket? And I got, I'm going right. to stay the night in my hotel. I'm like, no, we can no. do a stream yard. Yeah. And they're like, well, yeah, but I want to do it in person. I understand you want to do it in person and I'll get more views if you do it in person. And that makes me money if you do it in person. But if I pay you to come in, then yeah, it offsets different. all of that. And I may actually lose money. So, you know, I, I, and I, I don't feel it's appropriate for me to pay you for something that is essentially news. Sure. And by paying you, then you want to perform. And I, and I, I, no, really, I just really. feel like that's an issue and I'm not in a position to pay you. And this is how yeah. I pay my bills. And I'm, you know, so I give them that thing and I'm like, but listen, we can do a stream yard. And, and typically yeah. that, that quashes no it. Worries. They're like, no, I get it. I get it. Okay. And they do want to get more views. And so yeah. if it's possible, they fly themselves in. Fly themselves in. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just try and be honest up front to everybody I deal with. And, and that's just the best way. And 95% of the time they, they lean into it. They're, they're okay with, with that. So yeah. I was going to ask you a question. We never did talk about like, how are you funding your endeavor? Yeah. So that we've been lucky enough to have thousands of people all over the country and all over the world um, support us in the last 10 years. I mean, when we started my prior organization, Direct Action Everywhere in 2012, I mean, it was self-funded because I had been a corporate lawyer by that point for three, four years and had you know, something like half a mil in the bank because um, corporate law is very lucrative and right. I had no bills. I have not had much of a personal life and did very well in corporate law and got very big bonuses. Um, but starting in, I left my firm in 2014, I think it was. I left a, a firm called DLA Piper. It's literally the largest law firm in the world. Um and then self-funded for a little while, actually started my own legal practice on the side. So I was still doing about 20 hours a week in litigation and transactional work for basically tech companies in the Bay Area and making a lot of money off of it, honestly. And I, but I ultimately had to give it up starting in about 2015 
when our work started really blowing up and we had you know thousands of people participating and I was supposedly the leader. I just it was impossible to manage that project and also be responsible as a lawyer to my clients. So we ended the firm. It's probably 2016 or 2017 that we officially ended it. But by 2015, I was stepping out. I was a managing partner of my own law firm from 2014 to 2017 or so. And we had some big clients, you know, like Honda and Intel. So I right. still kind of regret giving it up because it was a very lucrative practice. And, you know, It didn't take that much work. But again, it just wasn't responsible to continue doing that. Um, and then starting in about 2017, 2018, we just had thousands and thousands of people. You know, At some point, I don't remember exactly how many thousands of members we had. But we had members who were contributing five, 10 bucks a month just saying, look, I want animals to be rescued. I want this stuff to be exposed. And I want people to fight in court for the idea that animals have rights. There's a difference between a puppy and a dented can. Right. There's a difference between a piglet and a piece of garbage you throw into a landfill. And I think the law should recognize that. And you know, we want to support and fight in that. So, you know, as much as I'd like to take credit for this work, the reality is we've had a huge team, not just the immediate team members who've been instrumental, the lawyers, the other activists and investigators who've allowed us to do the work we do. But I think at this point, it's tens of thousands, not even thousands of people who've chipped in. Sometimes it's two bucks a month. And that, you know, pays for veterinary care for an animal who's rescued. That pays for our legal cheese, for an expert witness we need to hire. Uh, so it's it's been a huge, huge team uh, and really, really gratifying to see how many Americans really do want to see animals protected from cruelty. And well, in this what, next case, will be in many ways the most powerful example of that because most people do not know their dogs being treated like test tubes who are being tortured in ways you could not even imagine. And this trial will be an opportunity to blow the, the lid open on that. What is the name of the organization? that you Did you start an organization or is it nameless? Yeah, I've actually started um, dozens of organizations, I think, at this point since 20. I guess 2007. Well, I mean, I actually started organizations even before I left Northwestern. So the the most prominent organization I started is a is a group called Direct Action Everywhere. It's a grassroots animal rights network. It's not even an organization. It's a movement, really. And, you know, there have been at least thousands, probably at this point, tens of thousands of people participating in that network. And it's what I'm most well known for. But more recently, I started a new organization called the Simple Heart Initiative. That is razor focused on rescuing animals. That's what we do. That's what we believe in. Um, that's what we encourage and support other people in doing. And we believe the efforts are legal. And we're testing out the legality of these efforts in the court of law, and including this next court case. And you know, again, we've just been lucky to have a lot of people. So, like my Substack has, I think thirty five thousand subscribers now, and I don't remember how many hundreds of paying subscribers. The paying subscribers don't actually get anything different. <laughs> so it's, it's, on some level, it's like, why are you paying for the stuff I'm giving everyone for free? But we have hundreds of people who just, they like the work, they like the content, so they chip in a few bucks. And, you know, I, I, I like to think that we're adding some value to their lives, um, just knowing that they're part of something. Because, you know, so many people go to work every day and they're like, this job is so stupid. You know, kind of the way I was when I was a corporate lawyer. I was making a lot of money, but I was going to sleep. I was wondering, what am I doing with my life? Right. And, one thing that did make me feel better when I was a corporate lawyer, I didn't just save money for my own future efforts, but I was a big donor at all these charities. And it was a lot of times people think like, I don't have money to give to good cause. And it's like, you can't, you don't have money not to give. Cause when you give, you actually feel better every day. Your life becomes better. It's like right. one of the best things you can do to make your life meaningful and to make you happier as a person. And there's evidence of this. You know, that when you give to other causes, when you're a generous person to your friends, your family members and charitable causes, you end up becoming a more productive and and happier member of society. And I saw that in my personal life because even when I was a corporate lawyer, the one thing that made me happy every day was, you know, knowing that I adopted some animal at a sanctuary and saying like, okay, that animal is able to, to get the vendor care she needs or she's able to get the food she needs every day because of me. That made me right. feel good. Yeah, I was going to say people will donate, you know, they'll they'll send me like to my my PayPal like 3 bucks, mm -hmm. 2 bucks. Yeah. And 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 I have people that will, you know, say or somebody cash at me $4 or $7 for a mm -hmm. cup of coffee. You know, hey, yeah. coffee's on me. It's, you know, I know it's silly, but what's but funny. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Right, it is because I was like this guy doesn't owe me anything. Anything, I know. You know. So you know, and I'll have guys like, oh, well, what's $2 going to do? Hey, bro, what are you telling me? You don't owe me nothing. Yeah, it, like, that's it's, yeah, it's not the amount. It's it's the mentality behind it and yeah. just the, the generosity of people. Right. And, so and the it, thing is, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this too. When you see people generous too, you want to be generous too. It just makes all of us better. When we're all right. generous, it makes the world a better place. 
And in contrast, when we're cruel to each other, and this is one of the fundamental reasons why these factory farms are so evil. It's not just that they're cruel to animals. They make all of us cruel. Like the levels of domestic violence against farm workers um, is, is astonishingly high. Um, right. You know, the, the same companies and CEOs, this guy Wan Long, who tortures animals. Surprise, surprise, he's caught up in a human trafficking scandal as well. Right. And again, he hasn't been held accountable. He's making money off of torturing not just animals, but human beings. When you're cruel to animals, you'll be cruel to other living beings, including human beings as well. So why not just be generous and kind to everyone? That's a better world for all of us. We can get there. We will get there. Did you ever, there's a, a documentary on um, Netflix called Ordinary okay. Men. Have you no. seen it? Not heard so, of it. You've heard people, I'm sure you've heard this. Uh, someone will talk about, and, and I'm, you know, and I, I know during in a, in you know high school when you're taking these classes and you start to learn about, you know, middle school, high school, you start to learn about World War II, right? And first thing every kid, teenager says is, "Well, I would never do that." You know, like that would never happen in America. That would never, you could, you would, ne you know, you never see people be that, you know, cruel to one group, you know, because, uh, you know, they were, you know, the, the, obviously the Jews are being, you know, Brandon with these, they, they've got these yellow, you know, everybody has to wear a yellow star of David and they're taking their houses and they're crashing yeah. their, destroying their businesses and they're throwing them in concentration camps and everybody knows the story. And, but most people will say, I would never participate in that. I would never do that. So there's yeah, a, Lord. yeah, but they would. There's a documentary yeah, that talks about they're like who made up these special special units that would yeah. go and round up the Jews and take them out into a field and have them dig their own graves, a one long grave and then execute them. And the men that made up those groups were pharmacists, uh -huh. CPAs, you know, yeah. lawyers. Like they were regular people that were doing this and all of them we're saying when the when the Nazis took over and the things that were slowly happening, we're all saying they didn't want to do the Nazi salute. They didn't agree with what was happening. They were disgusted by this. And within a year or so, when they were called up and asked to yeah, join these dirty. special groups, they did it. They did it willingly. Wow. You know, and so people say, oh, I would never do it. No, you would do it. People yeah. become very, very quickly, especially in groups. You know this especially yep. in groups, they become uh, very desensitized to all kinds of evils. Yeah. And people don't want to think that about themselves, but they would, you, you know, you would do it. And, and so I can see that in the, in the, um, animal, you know, industry, right? Yeah. Um, I could see being, you know, if you're able to, if you're able to be cruel to dogs and, and, you know, dogs oh. and cows and cause let's say cows are just, you know, they're just these big, stupid, you know, um, yeah. Uh, you know, they don't want to hurt anybody. You can walk right up to them, grab them by the head. Yeah. You can, you can rub their ears. They ru they lean into you. Yeah. They'll follow you. Yep. Um, you know, they're, they're like gentle. Yeah. They're super gentle. Like oh, practically like dogs, you know, they'll follow yeah, you. Like you can know you, they'll recognize you. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, if you can be cruel in that sense, you can carry that over to other parts of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you're being taught that this is the thing to do and authority figures are telling you it's a thing to do, your boss, uh, president, and you get away with police things. officer. Yeah. And you get away with it, then it'll happen. It becomes systematized. It becomes a part of just the system. And most people don't really think or rethink the systems. Oftentimes, even the systems hurting you, you don't really think about it. You know, people are trapped right. in various habits and patterns of behavior that are harming themselves and they can't even get out of it. I mean, much less a system that's harming somebody else. It's hard. Right. You know, it's, it's one of the scary things about human psychology, right? That we're all able to do these awful things. And that's definitely less of, of World War II. It's, it's scary. What I was going to say, what's, what's funny is, um, you, you get away with a small crime, which is what, like in my case, I got away yeah. with a small crime and I became a little bit more emboldened and then it right. got a little bit worse and a little bit and then it it, yeah. blew, it just got every time i got away with it i became more and more emboldened by like this is okay i'm good at this it's you know what i'm saying this is what i'm supposed to be right. doing this is i'm very you know I, I can get away with it because i'm so good at it like you become like you start to think you can do anything and get away with it yeah so i could i can see that uh happening yeah you know but the the reverse can also be true cycles of generosity. You have vicious cycles, but then you have virtuous cycles too. There's even social scientific literature on this that 
you know, a lot of times, like as people look at a story like mine and say like, oh my God, I could never do something like that. You know, rescue a farm animal or breaking a lab to rescue a beagle. And if I thought it was the right thing to do, just it seems scary, it's risky. And, you know, for me, fundamentally, it started with something as stupid as just being willing to donate a little money to an animal charity and just that small sacrifice and saying like, oh, you know, I thought it was going to be really hard, but I can give $5 a month. And then the next month, I'm like, oh, I, it's not just I can get $5 a month. I can go out there and hand out leaflets or show people video footage and educate people. And then you go from there, you're going to a protest. And then eventually, so, the, you know, you can create virtuous cycles too. The, the thing is, I mean, and I'm, I'm betting this is true of your experience too, that one of the things that leads people down both vicious and virtuous cycles is their capacity for risk. They're willing to take it that little step further. A lot right. of people just stop. There's a lot of people who go down and escalate it one way or the other. And they get to a certain point and say, like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> right. And when it, when it comes to crime and, you know, vicious cycles or self-harm, obviously you want to stop. Like, no, don't go from meth to heroin. Don't don't take right. that next step. Right. right. But with virtuous cycles, you actually want to get on that escalator because you can grow in these tremendous ways. And there's, you know, like if you read the talent code or, um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's book Outliers about how people become tremendously good at things too, just in skill too. A lot of it, it's it's not like someone becomes the world's greatest chess player or violin player overnight. It's they get on the silver escalator and they get this little 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 bit of dopamine because they see, oh man, I won that game. That's kind of surprising. I didn't think I was very good at chess. And they think, well, let me play another game. And maybe they lose the next five games, but they realize, oh, by the sixth game, I've learned something and I can beat people a little better. And and they go up that virtuous cycle. And but the key thing is at every step of the way. I'm not saying you challenge yourself to the point like if you're a beginning chess player, don't go up against a grandmaster, but you got to be willing to take that next step. And and that's probably true of, again, both vicious cycles and virtuous cycles, whether you become a, a cruel mastermind or, you know, Mother Teresa. Either way, it's because you're willing to push yourself away, you know? Right, right. Well, okay. listen, so if people wanted to donate, can do you have a link that I that you can give me and I can put in the... Yeah, just go to simpleheart.org and you can you know, support the newsletter. And that's that's the way we primarily accept contributions. You're part of the team. We'll, you'll be invited to our Slack uh, and you can join the conversation. And I guess that's the one kind of part. But honestly, we, we invite people to the Slack even if you don't contribute. Um, but I, you know, I would say even more important than contributing to, to our work and becoming a donor is just finding your own power. I just... I really think that there's so many people out there who, when they learn about, especially what happens to dogs, like dogs, come on, dogs, like they, they realize they have some power to create change. And that could be as simple as volunteering a local shelter, you know, or adopting a dog from a lab. There are a lot of these dogs who after years of torment, they just get them getting killed. And what if you think about animal experiments? And I think they're wrong. I think they should be abolished entirely. But even if you think some of them are justified after you've been caging and torturing this dog for five years, she deserves a loving home and sometimes hard to find homes for these poor creatures because they're so broken. They've got developmental problems. They've got psychological problems. Maybe your sacrifice is you adopt one of those dogs, you know, because they need help. They need families are going to love them unconditionally. But whatever it is that you can do, you know, and, and maybe that even just means being kind to someone in the workforce. But we live in a world right now where there's so much cruelty and violence and conflict. It's almost revolutionary just to be nice, be nice, you know, and, and be nice to people who don't expect you to be nice to them because it's easy to be nice to your boss. I mean, everyone's nice to their boss, but be nice to the homeless person. You know, like homelessness is a very complicated issue. I'm in the middle of San Francisco. We got a crisis on the streets. There's people on fentanyl sleeping in the building on the sidewalk right outside of my building right now. And it's hard to be nice to those people. And, and I'm not saying they don't have some responsibility for their problem, but, you know, it's not a challenge to be nice to your boss or the rich person who you're trying to raise funds from. It's harder to be nice to the person who just pooped on your side. Right. Right. It's harder to be nice to the chicken who is making your chicken nuggets. And you know, the, the main thing I'd ask everyone to do is just challenge yourself to be a kinder person because it really is pretty revolutionary in a world with so much cruelty to be kind. Um, we should all be striving to be a little kinder to the world around us. Right. So who, who is Jeremy? Um, Jeremy is one of our team members. He's the chief of staff of the Simple Heart. He's actually a, a former journalist himself. He used to work for NPR, and now he works for the animals because he saw well, a bigger and better purpose for his life, which I'm very grateful for him for joining the team. Well, Jeremy needs to have a talk with you about raising money. 
because you're horrible at it. Like I've given you multiple opportunities and you're like, but you don't even have to join. You don't have to do that. It's like, you know, yeah. you do, you, you know, you have to support, you know, every bit does help. I will say that every bit right. does help. And if you want to contribute, we got legal fees, we got, you know, um, costs for animals we've rescued. Uh, I got an animal we rescued in the room with me, Oliver. Um, and you know, I, I no longer am a corporal lawyer. And even if I, when I was a corporal lawyer, given the scale, we've now rescued hundreds of animals from abusive situations. And in each of those animals, it's not just, I mean, obviously saving those lives is huge. And I mean, I, I wake up every day and I've got a miracle in front of me. My dog rescued my dog. In front of me. But the bigger picture is we have a chance to educate tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people about the abuses these animals, dogs, cats, all sorts of animals are facing and change the system. So we are no longer being lied to. These laws are no longer being ignored and we can build a system that's kind to everybody. Okay. I yeah. like it. We should leave it there. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. This is so yeah, much yeah. fun. No, I, I appreciate you you talking to me for almost yeah. two hours. No, it's you know? look, I, I I love what you're doing and I love your story is such an inspiring story of redemption. I'm just so glad that people like you exist in the world and you're killing yeah, me. Let's just I'm yeah, just but trying it's, to make a living. I'm just trying to make a living. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, going coming from where you were to to making a living that's that's a tremendous tremendous accomplishment. Because again, I've seen it firsthand, and I'm I'm lucky. I'm very privileged. But a lot of people go through what you went through, and they, it breaks them. And it, I was going to say, it I, didn't I, break I feel, you. I feel very lucky too that it's come together. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, that's awesome. A lot of, that's a lot awesome. of luck. I'd rather be lucky than good. Um, it takes it, you got to be good to take advantage of your luck. That's what they say, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I think you're you were good enough. The better you are, the more lucky you get. I've heard that exactly. One, you know. <laughs> hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Assuming you like the uh, the interview, um, or maybe you're already subscribed. Whatever. Uh, leave me a comment, and I'm we're gonna leave the the link to simpleheart.org. In the description, you just click the link, you go there, it gives you options on how to donate. I uh, really appreciate you guys watching. Also, please consider joining my Patreon and leave me a comment. So I really do appreciate you guys uh, being here. See ya.